Greetings, eco-nerdlings. In this podcast, I'm going to be discussing ecology and symbiotic relationships. So before we get started, I wanted to read you this passage. This is the most dangerous animal in the world. It is responsible for millions of deaths every year. By its side, a great white shark swims peacefully. So when you hear about top predators and organisms that are dangerous in the news, we always think about sharks, killer whales, lions, tigers, bears, hyenas, all of these animals we associate with destruction and death. But instead, humans are actually the source of most of the destruction. We cause more deaths of not only our own species, but others. So ecology. We share the earth with a lot of other creatures, and unfortunately, we don't share it too well. We cut down forests to make paper, to make houses for ourselves, to use as fuels. We use our cars, which contribute to global warming and polluting the air. We have refineries and factories, and a lot of times we don't recycle, so our trash builds up everywhere. So I kind of like this picture. This is a bunch of uh, critters that are against the litter. So something that people have to work on, and this is something in your generation that you guys are really going to have to give a lot of thought to. How are you going to solve the crisis of overpopulation? And how are you going to solve the crisis of trash everywhere? How are we going to recycle everything? That's up to your generation. So ecology, putting it all together, Ecology is the study of interactions between creatures and their environment because everything is connected to everything else. Before we get started on symbiotic relationships, I'm going to give you a brief vocabulary review of terms that you're going to hear come up that I want to make sure you understand. So first thing we're going to talk about is habitat. This is the place where an organism or a population lives. So your habitat is your house, might even be your room. A niche is the total way of life or role of a species in an ecosystem. It includes all the physical, chemical, and biological conditions that a species needs to live and reproduce in an ecosystem. So a niche is kind of like your role or your job. Right now, your niche is a student. And right now, you might be watching this video lecture from my room. So your role is a student in my room watching this video lecture. Next is a predator. Predators are organisms that capture and feed on parts or all of another organism. Common predators you hear about are sharks, tigers, lions, killer whales, wolves. Those are all top predators. The prey is what they're consuming. So this is an organism that is captured and it serves as the food source for an other animal. Tragedy of the commons. This is something that you guys should have read about over the summer if you did your summer assignment. And a common property or resource which is owned by no one but available to everybody free of charge is what we refer to as a common. So everybody has access to it. Nobody really owns it. So unfortunately, so there's nobody really there to regulate everything. Anyone could kind of come and take whatever they want. And unfortunately, humans are a pretty greedy species. Most of the commons are actually renewable but we have to regulate what we do in order for those to become renewable. Examples of commons are clean air, open ocean and the fish that are in it, migratory birds, Antarctica, the ozone, and space. The next term we're going to discuss is called a keystone species. This is the major player when we're talking about food chains and food webs and ecosystems. So a keystone species helps determine the types and numbers of other species in a community, thereby helping to sustain it. So if something happens to a keystone species, you're going to see a drastic effect of all of the other organisms in that food chain or the food web within that ecosystem. A foundation species is kind of an expansion of the keystone species category. A foundation species can create and enhance habitats that can be benefited other species in the community. An example of a foundation species might be elephants. Elephants, when they're tromping through, they actually push over, break, and uproot trees. This creates forest openings for grass to come in, and it helps other species utilize the grass, so it can actually help bring in diversity. 
So finally, we're going to get to our symbiotic relationships. Now that you guys have a firm understanding of a niche, a habitat, as well as keystone species and commons. So just what is a symbiotic relationship? Symbiotic relationships are when there's a close and permanent association between organisms of different species living together. So for example, I have a symbiotic relationship with my two amazing little dogs, Emma and Molly. And I would say I have a mutualistic relationship with them because I give them lots of love and cuddles and care and food and water. And in turn, they give me love and affection and they let me little scratch their bellies. When I'm having a bad day, they kind of sit in my lap and they're like, mommy, what's wrong? I love you. So that would be a mutualistic relationship. So there are different types of symbiosis that I'm going to discuss today. And it's not limited to the terms that I'm going to discuss. There are so many different subclassifications of symbiotic relationships to cover. So I'm just going to hit on the main points. So what we're going to discuss today are parasitism, predation, commensalism, mutualism, and competition. Commensalism is when one species benefits while the other is neither harmed nor helped. So if we wanted to put it in numbers, one is going to get a plus and the other is going to get a zero. Meaning one benefits, it's gaining or increasing its fitness, and the other is not being harmed, but it's not being helped either. So an example of this would be these little sharks right here that are kind of riding with the manta ray. They're not expending as much energy as they would have to swimming by themselves. The manta ray is not really being helped, it's not really being hurt either. Another example would be cows and cowbirds. So as cows graze, they're actually kicking up all of these insects. And as the insects are kicked up, these egrets or cowbirds will come and feed on the insects. So the egrets aren't really affecting the cows at all. So the cow's not benefiting, but it's not being harmed at all. However, the egrets are actually benefiting because as the cows walk, they're kicking up insects, and the egrets can then eat those insects. Parasitism is probably the type of symbiosis that most of you have heard of and are most comfortable with. This is when one species feeds on another, and it enhances the fitness of one species, and it reduces the species of the other. So, it increases the fitness of the parasite, and it reduces the fitness of the host. So, in the case of a tick on a dog, the tick would be the parasite, and the dog would be the host. Another common example would be tapeworms. Sometimes we actually get tapeworms as humans if we consume food that's been tainted. So a tapeworm will live in our intestines, it'll kind of hook on, and it'll uptake our nutrients. Some species feed off of another species by living on or in them. So in the example of the tapeworm, that's actually going to be living inside of us. A tick or a flea is going to be on the outside of the dog. And one thing that I always found really, really crazy, when I was a, an undergrad in marine biology, we talked about the anglerfish, which is a deep sea fish. The male actually becomes a parasite to a female because it's so hard to find mates. So this male actually becomes parasitic. It latches onto the female. Basically, it deteriorates all of its internal organs except for its sperm. So it's literally a parasite. It gets all of its nutrients from the female latches onto her, and all it does is contribute sperm to the female. So kind of weird, and it's a parasitic type relationship because it is weakening that female a little bit by taking in all of her nutrients because it no longer feeds by itself. Parasites are usually much smaller than the host, and a parasite rarely kills the host because if it kills the host, it's going to have to go hunting for another one. And a parasite-host interaction can actually lead to coevolution. The next type of relationship is called mutualism. This is when both species benefit. So they're both gonna gain something positive out of that relationship. So the most common example that you guys always hear about are the clownfish and the sea anemones. The sea anemone is gonna provide protection for the clownfish, and the clownfish is going to bring in other fish and different bits and pieces of food to give the sea anemone nutrition. We also have a hummingbird right here the hummingbird is going to be taking the nectar out of a flower, so it's benefiting by getting nutrition. Then the hummingbird is going to be carrying that nectar, which also has pollen on it, to a different flower. So it's helping that flower reproduce or pollinate. 
Predation is the next type of relationship we're going to be discussing. This is when one species feeds on another and it enhances the fitness of the predator and obviously reduces the fitness of the prey because the prey is dead. So examples would be a grizzly bear with salmon right here, a great white shark eating a seal, and then a lioness, not the lions, because the lioness are one of the ones that do all of the hunting and all of the work, uh, killing the zebra right here. The prey is going to be the organism that is being eaten, and predators and prey are found in all organisms, uh, excuse me, found in all different types of ecosystems. So right here you have a bobcat that's hunting a snowshoe hare. This is going to be a marine type ecosystem. You have a killer whale that's um, purposely beaching itself, trying to get to this colony right here of pinnipeds. So it's going to beach itself and actually grab one of them and take it with him. So the role of predation in controlling population. There are two different types. We have a top-down control, and then we have a bottom-up control. If you think about the trophic levels, at the top of that pyramid is going to be our top predators. So think of that as the top-down control. In this sense, we have a lynx, and we have a hare. The lynx preying on hares periodically reduces the hare population. That's going to be an example of top-down control. The top predator is controlling the population from the top down. And if you look at the bottom-up control, this would be that the hare population may cause changes in the lynx population. So looking at this graph, you're going to see a relationship between the hare and the lynx population. The lynx is red, hare is blue. So if you look here, you're going to see an increase in the hare population, and then there's a little bit of an offset, and then the lynx population will increase. As the hare population decreases, you'll see the lynx population decrease. Hare population shoots up, and then eventually the lynx population goes up. The reason for that is that the hare is going to be controlling the population size of the lynx. If there is a lot of hare that reproduce and they have an overabundance of them, then they're going to be able to support more lynx. However, if the population of those hare dip, the population of lynx is going to decrease too because they're not going to have enough food to sustain their population size. Most consumer species feed on live organisms of other species. So predators can capture prey in many different ways. They can capture them just by walking, by swimming, flying, uh, pursuit and ambush, camouflage, and also by chemical warfare. An example of that might be a jellyfish. Prey can avoid capture by similar methods, by running, swimming, or flying, uh, protective measures such as shells, bark, thorns, like thorns on a rose bush. They can camouflage themselves to blend into their environment. Chemical warfare, so an example of that might be the ink that a squid will squirt out. Uh, poison dart frogs obviously excrete a poison that can kill the predators. Warning coloration, so a lot of prey will have really, really bright colors, and bright colors typically signifies danger. Don't come near me, don't eat me, I'm bad for you. Uh, mimicry and deceptiveness, as well as behavior. So some ways that prey avoid their predators, these are just some diagrams. We have the span worm and the wandering leaf insect. Those blend into their environment, so that would be camouflage. Uh, we have the foul-tasting monarch butterfly, and the viceroy butterfly, which doesn't taste bad. The monarch butterfly is actually slightly poisonous. The viceroy butterfly mimics it so it can deceive the predators into thinking that it's a monarch butterfly and the predators will stay away from it. We have the poison dart frog, which excretes poison through its skin. We have a moth that has these two eye spots right here, which looks like eyes from a much larger animal. So typically, that's going to help predators avoid them because they're going to be like, whoa, that's a little too big for me to eat. And another one right here, this is actually a caterpillar that looks like a snake whenever it's touched. So it scares off its prey into thinking that it's a snake. So threats to kelp forests, these are biologically diverse marine habitats. Uh, major threats to the kelp forests are sea urchins, pollution from water runoff, and global warming. So this is something we're going to talk a little bit about later, and it's going to employ the use of the term uh, keystone species and how a keystone species such as the sea otter is going to help control the growth of kelp forests by taking out the sea urchins that feed or destroy those kelp forests. 
Predator-prey interactions can actually drive each other's evolution, meaning they're going to co-evolve together. This is an intense natural selection pressure between the predator and the prey populations. Co-evolution occurs, again, over long periods of time. Uh, one of the main examples would be bats and moths. The echolocation that bats have can actually be heard by the moths because the moths have evolved very, very sensitive hearing so they can hear when bats are in the area and try to avoid being eaten. So this is an example of a bat hunting a moth. And another type of coevolution is when two or more species evolve in response to one another. So the example you see right here is going to be the cheetah and the antelope. The cheetah gets fast, so the antelope gets fast. They're both very, very quick. That way they're constantly co-evolving. They're evolving longer limbs, they're evolving faster speeds at which to run either away from each other or towards each other, depending upon if you're the antelope or the cheetah. We also have competition. This is when two species share a requirement for a limited resource, and it reduces the fitness of both species. Because if you're both competing, you're both expending energy, and you're both losing out. So we have the deer mouse and the kangaroo rat. We have these two birds fighting over the same food source. And we have these guys right here that are probably fighting over a mate. So these would probably be the bucks that are going to be competing for their mate. Since resources will eventually run out, organisms compete for them. There are two main types. We have intraspecific and interspecific. Intraspecific can be between members of the same species, like polar bears that have to compete for the same fish that they eat. Interspecific can be between members of different species. So for example, a robin and a woodpecker competing over a tree to build a nest. So this is an example of competition. We have our kangaroo rat and our deer mouse. And this basically shows us what the effect of the kangaroo rat is on the deer mouse. So the purple is when the kangaroo rats are excluded, meaning they've been taken out of the area that the deer mice live. So obviously you can see that the deer mice do much better or their population drastically increases when that kangaroo rat has been removed from the environment. The control right here is when the kangaroo rat is released into the environment. And as you can see, the population of those deer mice is drastically decreased in the presence of kangaroo rats. The competitive exclusion principle, this is something I want to make sure you guys take notes over because I have seen it on several of the exams. So the competitive exclusion principle states that if two competing life forms attempt to occupy the same niche, only one outcome is possible. One life form will drive out the other. Kind of like two fighters go into the ring and it gets closed until one comes out. Same thing with the competitive exclusion principle. Can't occupy the same niche at the same time. One is going to win over the other. We do have different ways of uh, sharing resources or partitioning them. Sometimes you can use only parts of the resource using the resource at different times, or using it in different ways. So one primary example is the use of trees by different species of birds. The Blackburnian warbler uses the top and very outsides of the trees. The black-throated green warbler will use kind of the middle of the tree. The Cape May warbler will use the very top of the tree. The bay-breasted warbler will use the middle of the tree in this little V shape. And then the yellow-rumped warbler will use the bottom of the tree. Now, of course, you are going to get some overlap, but you're going to be able to share the tree, and so all of the birds are going to be able to build their nests. We also have specialist species uh, of different types of honey creepers. So right here, you have ones that have evolved beaks that are more suited to feed on fruit and seeds. And over here, we have longer, thinner beaks that are more suited to eating insects as well as nectar. Especially this guy right here, he's going to be a nectar feeder. This very long beak is so he can stick his beak way into very long flowers and get the nectar out. So in summary, we're going to talk about the different relationships. So mutualism is going to be a plus plus, both members benefit. Commensalism, one is going to benefit and one is neither helped nor harmed. In both predation and parasitism, one is going to be helped the 
parasite is going to be helped and the predator is going to be helped and the other is harmed. So the host is harmed and the prey is obviously harmed. In competition, right here, we're going to have a negative negative. Last thing we're going to discuss before we end this podcast is carrying capacity of a population. This is the maximum number of individuals that an ecosystem can support. And once that carrying capacity is met, limiting factors such as food, shelter, space, mates, different types of resources, it keeps that population size in check. And that is called the carrying capacity. So this is a graph representing the carrying capacity. So you see the number of individuals that a ecosystem can support, it'll grow exponentially until it reaches its cutoff. So there's always a carrying capacity. If there wasn't, we would have exponential growth of everything on Earth. And that includes people. So right now, there's a big debate about what the carrying capacity for people or the population of humans on this Earth is. But that's something we'll get to on the next time. Well, I hope this podcast was informational for you guys. This is the Queen Nerdling signing out. Stay nerdy till next time. And if you want to see more videos from me, you can keep up with me on Twitter at Queen Nerdling. Or you can follow me on Facebook at www.facebook.com.nerdlingscience.